Well, we have a real special uh, treat for you all uh, this morning. Um, uh, welcome and good morning. Uh, Dr. Brian Annix is here uh, with us today from University of Virginia. Uh, Dr. Annix is the um, George Beller Distinguished Professor and Chief of the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Virginia. And um, he uh, has a, uh, is an expert in peripheral arterial disease and angiogenesis and um, is one of the few chiefs of cardiology I know that is uh, capable of doing basic research, translational research, and clinical research um, in his area. And uh, you'll see he's uh, kind of got a broad spectrum of investigative activities, made a lot of contributions over the years. Uh, he started his training in, uh, at Yale and uh, from there went to Tufts. And that was, um, that changed the course of his career because uh, he, at the time, uh, uh, Peter Libby was there and uh, Jeff Isner. And uh, in rounding with them, he got excited about peripheral arterial diseases and angiogenesis. And so he went in that direction. Went from there to Duke uh, as a junior faculty member and rose through the ranks to be uh, the vice chief of uh, cardiovascular medicine there. And while he was at Duke, did much of his um, seminal work in angiogenesis. He started a national consortium for angiogenesis and peripheral arterial disease. Uh, he combined his expertise in uh, intervention uh, and his scientific knowledge to uh, develop a very active cohort of investigators uh, that were studying uh, the uh, therapeutic angiogenesis for peripheral arterial disease. So he, he may mention a little bit about that uh, in his talk. Um, he has uh, three R01s and um, is uh, very successful at uh, funding his basic science uh, work and running a busy uh, cardiology division. So, you know, and maybe at some point you can tell us how you managed to do all <laughs> that, Brian. But anyway, please uh, welcome Dr. Brian Annix today. <laughs> Well, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, John. One of the, you know, great things about um, <clears throat> academic medicine is you meet a lot of people along the way. Uh, John is just a uh, uh, absolute prince of a, a guy, and, and I'm very delighted and very happy to see uh, how well things are uh, going for him. Um, and uh, I, I, again, I, I do feel a little bit. Bring, this is like bringing coals to Newcastle. If I'm going to talk about peripheral arterial disease uh, with John here, but we do have slight, you know, different perspectives on it. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk, it's going to be roughly half clinical, half to, to, uh, 60 percent. Then I'm going to launch into a little bit of a basic science approach. To with some recent work we're doing. Uh, time permitting, I'll finish with some clinical research we're doing um, and leave some time for questions. Um, I always list these conflicts. I really don't believe I'm going to present a single word about anything about any of these companies, but I always hate the idea that I might accidentally do it and not have given the slides um, ahead of time. So our goal for today is going to be review the current risk factors for peripheral arterial disease. We're going to review the major clinical manifestations of peripheral arterial disease, uh, really to understand current medical therapies, as well as making it absolutely clear why we need new therapies. Okay, this is going to sound basic, but believe it or not, when I would give this talk about eight, ten years ago, and I asked people what the ankle brachial blood pressure index, even in a cardiology audience, probably about half would raise their uh, hand. I think, uh, you know, John was president of the Society of Vascular Medicine uh, and Biology and really uh, was actually one of the, during his time uh, leading the group, was really seminal in dispersing information on PAD. So I don't think we have to go over that uh, anymore, but just again, a reminder here is the ankle brachial blood pressure index is the hallmark of PAD. This is going to be the blood pressure uh, in the ankle, one of the two blood pressures compared to the blood pressure uh, in the arm. And again, in case I don't go over it again, 
Remember, normal is 1.1 to 1.3. Anybody who works in the cath lab knows femoral artery pressures are actually a little bit higher than aortic pressures or just above the aortic valve. Uh, abnormal is less than 0 0.9. This may soon change to 0 0.95. And uh, abnormal, I got the arrow going the wrong direction. That should be greater than 1.3 uh, is an example of a non-compressible vessel. So I'm going to give you a couple of clinical cases to put this in perspective. And uh, for the fellows and junior faculty, uh, wherever there's a star, this is a teaching moment, okay? So when I was at Duke and was doing a lot of work in PAD, we really didn't have a vascular clinic. So I said, you know, I think we really need to start a vascular clinic, which I started on Friday at an off-campus site. So if you want to be friendly to your chief of cardiology or your department chair, volunteer to do a clinic on Friday. Okay, for whatever reason, there is never a lack of rooms on a Friday. So I offered to do that, and we had, our clinic was closed to anybody but vascular patients. If our clinic wasn't full, then within three days they would put in non-vascular patients, and so this was a patient we had. 57-year-old man, routine follow-up, status post, three-vessel bypass three weeks earlier. Classic cardiac risk factors of diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, smoking. One year prior, he had unstable angina, had a cardiac catheterization that showed two-vessel coronary artery disease. He underwent stenting with a drug-eluting stent uh, to his LAD. was well until two weeks prior when he had progressive angina. Cardiac cath showed advanced disease, and the course said he had an uneventful post-operative course. So you ask him, How's he doing? And he says, well, I feel as well as can be expected, uh, except the site where they harvested the vein is red. Sure enough, we went on, and this, guy, and this person had bilat reduced pulses bilaterally with ABIs of 0.3 and 0.5. The point I want to make here, if you look, this person went to the cath lab no less than three times in a year, and nobody picked up on the idea that he had peripheral arterial disease. Uh, that doesn't end. I was actually went to the University of Virginia and decided to round on the general medical service. Fortunately, I only made that mistake one time. Uh, showed up on the wards. Uh, Rob was not the resident on the time uh, because this is what the, this was the patient who we had. An 84-year-old man was being was. Uh, uh, undergoing antibiotic treatment for an infected right foot and non-healing ulcer. He had no coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease. His risk factors were smoking and diabetes. Remember that, because that will come back. And I got on, the ID attending was there, and there was just an elaborate discussion about the utility of growth on wound cultures to predict the outcome of antibiotic therapy. They had three papers. They were discussing all of them. I walked on and said, so show me two words. And the first uh, word has five letters and the second four. Where is the blood flow? That person ended up having an ABI that was actually, uh, actually unmeasurable uh, in that leg. Uh, had been followed in the general medicine clinic for no less than 30 years uh, and again, it had never been uh, picked up. Okay, uh, peripheral arterial disease now, as a general comment, is a complication of systemic atherosclerosis. For many, many years, this was the poor stepchild to coronary artery disease. Uh, I think we all learned, um, in when I learned in medical school, that it had one-tenth the prevalence of coronary artery disease. That's clearly not true. The prevalence is about 8 to 12 million people in the U.S. alone, uh, roughly three-quarters that of coronary artery disease. Uh, and even more recent data confirms that's true. So if you want published data, uh, that's... Um, that's a good way to do it. Josh Beckman, who's an old friend of mine uh, that John knows, who's at the Brigham and now at Vanderbilt, has the 433 rule, which is an internist for every 10 patients they have with um, atherosclerosis. Four will have coronary artery disease alone. Three will have peripheral arterial disease alone. And three will have a combination of coronary artery disease and peripheral arterial disease. Unpublished, but if you want to use it as an idea, uh, that's how prevalent the disease is. 
And while rates of coronary artery disease are declining, actually in almost uh, any, every group with the exception actually of black men, but whether you look at white men, white women, black women, rates of first myocardial infarction and death are clearly going down. Everybody's seeing this. Everybody's seeing this in cath lab volumes. Uh, this is not the case for peripheral arterial disease. Uh, finally, from the perspective, I, I always want to throw a slide in on this. Um, remember, vascular medicine is not peripheral arterial disease. Peripheral arterial disease is one small uh, aspect of vascular medicine, but vascular medicine actually covers the areas of cerebrovascular disease, mesenteric disease, prevention, venous disease. I don't know if you guys are participating in this uh, DVT PE program, uh, which is again a really exciting effort to try to figure out how to address uh, pulmonary emboli, uh, lymphatic diseases, and vasculitis and mixed connective tissue diseases. Uh, one of the things you always try to do in academia, by the way, is to make yourself obsolete. And I've actually recruited a vascular medicine person from the Cleveland Clinic. So thank goodness now all the patients that get referred in, I send to him. Uh, and so I'm able to go back to uh, doing just uh, the general things, but not have to deal with a lot of these diseases, quite frankly, that I did for a while, but um, probably need subspecialty um, uh, training. Okay. Calculating the ABI, I mentioned this before, this sounds trivial, but I can assure you this was actually on the interventional cardiology boards last time. It was, uh, um, maybe not last time, but at least the time before that. And they will ask you to calculate the ABI, and again, you take the higher right ankle pressure of the dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial and uh, divide it by the higher arm pressure, not the right arm and the right leg or the left arm and the left leg. You're going to feel really silly on the boards, okay, when you read these page-long questions that you're trying to struggle through, and here they're giving you a softball, and uh, you can easily miss it because they will easily give you that one. So we try to remember that point. Probably more people talk about the limitations of the ankle brachial blood pressure index. Again, ABI takes about 10 minutes to do, completely non-invasive, and you hear this all the time. The patients will have incompressible arteries, particularly the elderly or patients with diabetes or renal failure. The ABI may be insensitive for detecting mild aortoiliac disease, possibly true. It's not designed to define the functional limitations. ABI does not equal disease severity. I will come back to that uh, in the talk. And nor normal resting values in symptomatic patients may become abnormal after exercise. So if you do on a board question C, a patient reports leg pain with walking or bending over and has a normal dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial, what is the next test? And it's actually an exercise uh, ABI because it can actually uh, become abnormal with uh, uh, exercise. This slide is probably worth looking at. You can look at it on one way and, and look at the risk factors for peripheral arterial disease. And they all look pretty similar, right? You see smoking, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. The problem is that actually in some ways, I, I, I'm not sure that's really the best way to think about it. After you adjust for age, smoking and diabetes account for about 90% of the age-adjusted risk for peripheral arterial disease. In fact, to some degree, up until very recently, where and I might talk about this at the very end if I have time, the you were told if you didn't have smoking and diabetes, you pretty much did not have peripheral arterial disease. We've seen plenty of patients go through the cath lab, have two bypass surgeries, multiple stents, and their only risk factors are hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. These are probably not the same diseases to some degree. They are both complications of atherosclerosis, but have a very different um, uh, makeup. Uh, the American Diabetes Association, by the way, has been well ahead of us. Uh, back in 2003, a consensus statement stated that due to the high estimated prevalence of PAD in patients with diabetes, a screening ABI should be performed in patients over 50. 
And if the test is normal, it should be repeated every five years. Effectively, kind of like a colonoscopy uh, is used, and the ADA stated based on their data uh, that this should be done. And ABI sh uh, sh should be considered in diabetic patients less than 50 who have other atherosclerotic risk factors. So if you remember smoking, diabetes, age over 70 or age over 50, those are effect if you have diabetes or smoking. Those are your screening uh, tools for PAD. Um, more recently, a paper in vascular medicine actually showed that insulin resistance alone, you did not actually have to meet the definition of being frankly diabetic, uh, imposed an increased risk of PAD. So um, I think this definition, this will be evolving uh, in the years to come. Okay, there's two discrete clinical syndromes in patients with peripheral arterial disease. And, and I'm going to use this a fair amount both, again, to drive home some points as to why we're missing uh, PAD as well as actually tell you how it launched uh, some of our research efforts. So the two large symptomatic ones are intermittent claudication, which is uh, patient, it comes from the Latin claudico, which is to limp, uh, and effectively, patients with intermittent claudication are those with leg pain with walking uh, with, that's relieved with rest. I love giving this question whenever on cardiology, and I remind patients that actually a patient with intermittent claudication has a higher age-adjusted mortality than patients who have an uncomplicated acute myocardial infarction. So I will often ask, which one is more likely to die in the next five years, a patient with an ABI of 0.9 and leg pain with walking or a patient who had an inferior wall myocardial infarction uh, and a normal ejection fraction after stenting. Then there's also critical limb ischemia, and these patients have rest pain, non-healing ulcers, tissue necrosis, and they have a very high mortality rate, uh, one that remains in the 25 to 40% uh, at five years. Okay, there are four myths about peripheral arterial disease that I really would like to dissuade uh, uh, during this talk. The first one is, why should I be concerned about PAD in my patients? They will report symptoms on a, uh, even on a review of symptoms, a review of systems. By the way, do you guys use Epic or which <laughs> medic? Okay, yeah, all right. Well, you know, you have that box where you check, uh, and I'm sure everybody has checked that, right, uh, for claudication symptoms. Problem is, what I want to show you is it's basically going to be worthless, okay? Pretty much anybody can figure this out. If a patient's walking on the beach, and particularly if they're a gray-haired white male and they're grabbing their leg, uh, and the picture here shows pain in their leg with walking, right, that's not going to be terribly hard to figure out. The problem is that that actually doesn't work all that uh, well, sorry. So there is the ROSE criteria in peripheral arterial disease, which in many ways is one of the double-edged swords for the, the field. The ROSE criteria states that patients have calf or buttock pain brought on by exertion relieved with rest. Two-thirds of patients with intermittent claudication will have difficulty walking 150 uh, feet. That's about one city block. One-third of patients have difficulty actually walking around their house. Patients that are symptomatic with PAD are actually very symptomatic. They have a maximum walking speed of one to two miles per hour. I actually will challenge anybody to try to walk at that speed. You will get trampled uh, in the hallway. And your average claudication patient has a, has a VO2 max of roughly the same as a class 3 heart failure patient. And, you know, for these patients, we have probably four, five, six drugs uh, that we're adding on. So again, symptomatic claudication is a bad disease. It is not that hard to figure out. The problem is that if you take patients with an abnormal ABI, so they have confirmed peripheral arterial disease, more than half will actually have no claudication symptoms 
or they will have what we call atypical claudication symptoms because they will not meet the Rose criteria. If you ask them and do a VO2 max test on them, they will be just as bad off as the symptomatic patients, okay? But again, this has been one of, in my mind, one of the major limitations. The thought has been that all we have to worry about are patients who report symptoms, and the fact is that just simply isn't, uh, isn't the case. Um, Again, a critical limb ischemia is pretty easy to recognize when you see it, uh, but remember, a lot of patients with critical limb ischemia will present and have no reportable antecedent history of intermittent claudication. They did not develop this, AB, this uh, critical limb ischemia and atherosclerosis to the lower extremity in the couple of weeks before they had uh, this injury to their foot that developed the, not the ischemic ulcer. Okay, why should I be concerned about it? I'll come back to the same point. I only need to worry about symptomatic patients. Actually, that's not true. Uh, basically, recent work by Mary McDermott uh, at Northwestern, who I think Mary has done more to advance our understanding of PAD uh, in the population than anybody uh, has shown that there is actually an age-adjusted association of ABI with mortality. Uh, and again, that goes up for every degree. Um, the hazard ratio goes up as you go to the left with every worsening of the ABI. Again, probably just a measure of the degree of uh, atherosclerosis. And I went over that. Okay, why should I be concerned about uh, PAD in my patients? If present, the treatments are easy. Okay, this is a star. Who wants to tell me what the treatment is for PAD and especially claudication? Exercise, very good. And actually works really well, especially when you go up the escalator. And in fact, we see this all the time, a study done uh, that looked at, which was a meta-analysis of all the supervised exercise studies, said that exercise improved pain-free walking time in claudicans by an average of 180 uh, percent and maximal walking time around 120 percent. The problem is, I think it's actually sort of created a bit of an idea that the disease is easy to treat and if patients have leg pain and they don't want to walk they're somehow not following your advice not following your therapy okay and they could just get better if they wanted to do that in fact this is probably the worst example of a completer complier analysis you take 100 patients who come in for supervised exercise, you tell every one of them they're going to walk for 45 minutes on a treadmill, getting to 18 out of 20 leg pain on a Borg scale, which is not something out of Star Trek. It actually is defined by the American College of Sports Medicine, okay? And they look at you like you've got three heads, okay? And then the other group you bring in, and they run into a complication. You take the group that responded and went through the program, and lo and behold, they got better. It's kind of like taking an antihypertensive and saying, I'm only going to study it in patients who I give it to, and their blood pressure goes down. Well, guess what? It is going to work in that situation. Um, there are some advances going on in the area of exercise. Uh, pay attention to work by uh, Andy Gardner at University of Oklahoma, who's developed a home uh, exercise program. Uh, by the way, if you're asked on the boards, it must be supervised exercise. And Diane Treat Jacobson up at University of Minnesota, who has a protocol for using arm exercise uh, to potentially uh, improve patients with uh, PAD. Uh, if this is a very classic board question, the indications for lower extremity revascularization, these are the only two. They are lifestyle limiting uh, intermittent claudication. Now, it's possible walking around New York, walking at one mile an hour might be more uh, in interfering than other areas. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the board question uh, that they will ask you. Uh, or limb-threatening ischemia with, again, the patients with ischemic rest pain, non-healing ulcers, or gangrene. So if you were asked that, the board question is not revascularization for stable intermittent claudication. You have to meet these criteria. Uh, a very quick word, and I'm not going to go through a lot of the detail on this. The bottom line is, 
Interventions done in the iliac area are highly uh, successful, highly durable. Those done in the SFA area, less successful and less durable. And those done in the distal vessels are, are actually less far less successful and far less uh, durable. I don't want to go much beyond that for this talk, just some basic points to know. Um, finally, why should I be concerned about PAD in my patients? Patients with intermittent claudication, and this is true, will only progress to critical limb ischemia at a rate of about 1% per limb per year. That's absolutely true. And we've assumed our patients were uh, stable, the inference being that PAD is stable. And again, Mary McDermott's work, very uh, a little bit older now, showed that actually the adjusted average annual change in six-minute walk performance over a two-year period, actually patients with PAD were actually getting worse, even if we did not get any worser symptoms. By the way, if this were your heart failure patients, okay, would you accept this loss uh, in peak VO2 over that period of time? You would likely be doing uh, additional investigations or looking toward uh, additional therapies. Okay, medical therapies for PAD. This is really where we should be going, right? Well, here's tested a short list, probably, of tested and approved medical therapies for coronary artery disease. Uh, aspirin, the clopidogrel, ticagalor, the PY2P inhibitors, statins, ACE, ARBs, beta blockers, smoking cessation, glycemic control, even mineralocorticoid receptors uh, if the patient has a reduced ejection fraction. And we have for coronary disease really good surrogate markers. We know what works. We know what doesn't work. We can pretty much do studies that talk about 300 milligrams versus 600 milligrams of clopidogrel, right? We can bring all these things through. Okay, what about PAD? Not exactly the same. So just to show you what the field looks like, aspirin actually has a 1A indication, clopidogrel a 1B indication. By the way, a Capri study done probably about 20 years ago showed that clopidogrel actually beat aspirin uh, in a head-to-head -head comparison, yet they have differences of 1A versus 1B. A very interesting, if you want to read an article, I encourage you to look at this one by Jeff Berger and Bill Hyatt in circulation. It actually even questions whether aspirin has any value or any role in PAD. Uh, there's no role uh, for dual antiplatelet therapies. Statins are given a class 1 uh, indication with the level of evidence B. Um, ACE inhibitors, again, are derived from the large coronary artery disease trials. Uh, there are data on blood pressure control. You finally get the beta blockers and you go, hot dog, I got a 1A level of indication. But all it is is it tells you it's safe, by the way. Remember, there was the old idea that you have alpha tone and beta tone in the periphery. You block the beta, you have unopposed alpha, you have unopposed alpha, you have vasoconstriction, right? And so therefore, you didn't want to give beta blockers to patients with peripheral arterial disease. Terrific idea if you're a rat, not necessarily if you're a person. Uh, so again, data showing that it was quite safe. Um, smoking uh, cessation, again, we use, this is based off one published report in the Australian Journal of Medicine, um, and in fact, the last drug approved for uh, PAD was Solastazole, which was approved in 1999. A lot's happened since then. Uh, I'm a Yankee fan, so this is very painful to show, but since the last drug was approved for PAD, the Red Sox have actually won the World Series three times. Okay, if ever there's a need to develop new therapies, this shows uh, that's true. Okay, so how do you approach this? This is a typical magnetic resonance angiogram. For patients who, for people who don't deal with PAD patients, but look at a lot of coronary angiograms, this is worth looking at. So this is a patient who walked into our clinic for a first visit, and here's his MRA back before we had concerns about the... Um, uh, the contrast, and basically there should be a blood vessel going from here to here. This person had an occlusion about this long, okay? 
Compare that to most patients with coronary disease who have blockages that are typically measured in millimeters. These are measured in actually centimeters. But I'm going to pose to you at the end of the day, the problem is inadequate blood flow, and this inadequate blood flow is greatest distal to the leg. Uh, John mentioned that we spent probably 10 plus years trying to study this process called angiogenesis. It does, the red doesn't show up, I'm sorry about that. But the top says angiogenesis, which is the growth and proliferation of new blood vessels from existing vascular structures, while therapeutic angiogenesis is the growth of new vessels to treat disorders of inadequate tissue perfusion. And we've probably conducted over 10 to 15 of these studies. If there's one slide that actually shows the epitome of this field, it was a paper Sanjay Rajagopalan and I uh, published in 2003, which was used in adenovirus expressing VEGF-121. Everybody got better in the trial. The problem is everybody got better, whether you got drug or whether you got low dose or whether you got high dose. And in fact, Everybody thought, oh, there's something wrong here. The patients are getting better. We're just missing it. Here was the change in the ankle brachial blood pressure index in the placebo group, 0, 0.00, in the low dose group, 0, 0.00, and in the high dose group, 0, 0.00. Uh, by the way, does anybody besides John remember what the original name of vascular endothelial growth factor was? It was actually called vascular permeability factor. And in fact, we did induce vascular permeability. If you got a low dose of the virus, 20% of the patients had clinically significant edema within 30 days, 28% of those in the high dose group. So we were able to induce vascular permeability, just not therapeutic angiogenesis. So really, our lab has been trying to develop uh, new ways to deliver agents, new ways to assess agents in trials, but mostly what we spend our time on is trying to develop new agents. And we rely fairly heavily on an animal model or a mouse model uh, of PAD, where we try as best we can to replicate from the, here's the aorta of a human, here's the aorta of a mouse, and try to create this area of a ligation excision to kind of match what we saw in this patient. And we can measure angiogenesis in the distal muscle, arteriogenesis in the thigh, as well as the cell response in the blood and the muscle. The workhorse is this laser Doppler uh, perfusion imaging. But everybody's got to have your special sauce, right? Everybody can do these PAD models. What is the angle that we take? And Here's our special sauce. So back in 2004, there were two patients that we were seeing. And if you want to fact check me, you'll see 2004 and 2004. Uh, this patient was actually enrolled in one of our NIH trials looking at the effect of exercise training. This person on the right was in a phase one first in human gene therapy study with a zinc finger activating VEGF transcription factor. But what I'm not showing you is that these patients were the same age, same risk factors, absolutely identical. Their ABIs were absolutely identical. And if I showed you their angiograms, you could not tell the two apart. And so with that, what we did is we posed that there could be uh, genetic factors that influence this. And instead of using animal models to replicate humans, we tried to use our human finding and see if we can replicate this in animals. And so it turns out that C57 black six mice are a strain that get very good perfusion recovery. Bulb C mice are a strain that get very poor perfusion recovery. You see here that we generated an F1, which is a cross of each of these. The F1 acted like the black six. We then crossed the F1 back to the bulb C, and we had 105 mice. This was operated on all in one week um, by one of our fellows. Um, and by the way, this is a lot harder than doing angioplasties are in humans. I would typically get interventional cardiology fellows. Uh, we, t we had some interventional cardiology fellows that no mouse survived uh, their hands. Um, but yet they did totally fine in the interventional lab. Um, 
And so we took these 105, got a spectrum of uh, outcomes, sent it for genome-wide linkage analysis, and basically showed a single peak across here across the chromosomes in mice, a LOD score about 7.3 or 300 million to one that some gene in this area uh, was accounting for that difference. By the way, this is a challenging animal model. 50% of the variability in the outcome was explained by the genetics, not the variability just from animal to animal. And we got the same data uh, if we use perfusion imaging. I thought this was great. You will notice we published this in 2008, um, and our overnight success was realized about seven years later as we've now published about four papers uh, from uh, this uh, approach of new agents for PAD based on the differences in outcome strains. Uh, this uh, paper in American Journal of Pathology um, identified a, a gene called BAG3. We identified a microRNA, and I'm going to spend some time now talking about the interleukin-21 uh, receptor, and more recently, uh, um, a, pa a paper on the ADAM12 gene. Uh, by the way, Ayatunde just got an R01 funded. Uh, on this, and Sorovi, who's here, uh, just got her scientist development grant uh, funded on microRNAs. Okay, a funny thing happened between the map in 2008 and 2015, and that is genetics actually got a little bit smarter, and the position of these genes actually changed, and sure enough, the interleukin-21 receptor lied right at the peak of this association. This study began, we looked at C57 black 6 following Heinlein ischemia. You see a big increase in the messenger RNA for IL-21 receptor. And when we looked at an endothelial fraction or an EC fraction, you see this increase was even greater. We did co-staining for interleukin-21 receptor, CD31, merged it. And then what we did is we did fax analysis looking at cells that came out of the bulb C muscle, and you see between the non-ischemic and the ischemic, they completely overlapped each other, whereas in the black 6 mice, uh, there was this big increase uh, in IL-21 receptor positive cells. Okay, now this is published data, but I was trying my best to kill this project. First, it had the word interleukin on it, okay, and I knew as soon as I sent a grant in, a bunch of immunologists are going to get this grant and go, this person has no business sending a grant in on interleukin. He's not smart enough to figure this out. They probably are right. But the other reason I wanted to kill the project, oh, I'm sorry, let me show you one more piece of data. Um, we actually had the opportunity to collaborate with Warren Leonard uh, at the NIH, uh, who provided us with interleukin-21 receptor knockout mice. We showed they had impaired perfusion recovery and an FC chimera protein that absorbed interleukin-21. So we could get past any genetic differences. Both of them showed a loss of function, a reduced capillary density uh, shown here for an impaired angiogenic response. The problem is, when we started this project, this was the only paper we could find on interleukin-21. And it says interleukin-21 inhibits angiogenic sprouting of endothelial cells. And sure enough, here is what happens when you took aortic rings and exposed them to IL-21. You see a dose-dependent reduction in sprouting. Uh, and again, shown down here, comparing to interleukin-2, uh, which actually had no effect, and you see it visually here. So why would we want to study an angiogen, angiostatic protein to try to induce therapeutic angiogenesis? And this is why sometimes, at the end of the day, if your data leads you in a direction that you don't think is right, you still got to follow it through. So what I'm going to do is spare you all the three or four figures and eight or ten panels and just show you this composite. This is what happens. When interleukin-21 binds its receptors in the setting of a high growth factor situation, you actually get signaling through this transcription factor STAT1. And in fact, we could confirm that. And that paper on IL-21 being angiostatic was indeed correct. The problem is, skeletal muscle is ischemic, right? 
So what happens when you do the same experiment under hypoxia or serum starvation? Skeletal muscle has very, very low levels of growth factors. You actually don't see signaling through STAT1, but actually through STAT3 and an increase in a number of survival factors. Okay, so I presented this actually at a meeting uh, where there was not a cardiology audience, and they said, um, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing, sorry. Uh, it's going to be important to understand whether this happens in humans, and in a paper in vascular medicine, we showed the same thing that happens in mice, by the way, happens in humans. So you see more IL-21 receptor co-localizing with endothelial cells from skeletal muscle biopsies uh, from PAD subjects versus control. So humans upregulate them the same way C57 black six mice do. But I, they posed to me and said, are you out of your mind? You're going to give interleukin-21 uh, to a patient, okay? And they thought I was absolutely out of my mind, and I just gave the general, I'm just a cardi dumb cardiologist, so we'll figure it out as we work with you very smart people in other areas, okay? So this was sort of their reaction, but still hearing about it, we decided that if interleukin-21 was not actually going to be a good approach, uh, we looked at the ischemic limb muscle where we had IL-21 receptor activation versus inhibition. One, we get good perfusion recovery. One, we get angiogenesis and STAT3 activation. Uh, and we did transcriptome analysis of that. This is unpublished data uh, at this point. We'll be submitting it uh, very soon. But what you could see here, by the way, transcriptome is just a very nice word for saying you did RNA analysis, but it just sounds a lot better than RNA uh, analysis. Um, and what you see here is that if you look with different fold uh, differences, you see 27.5% if you look at genes regulated by the FC Chimera, a full 27.5% of STAT3 transcripts were regulated in this uh, pathway, only 1% of STAT1. And if you go to a fold of two, we can get 100% specificity uh, for STAT3. Uh, we confirm that, and these are lists of a few genes. When we thought something was downregulated, sure enough, it was downregulated. And when it was upregulated, we confirmed uh, that it was upregulated. This turns out to be a very interesting one called connective tissue growth factor. And I'm not going to show you, but we have data that when we restore interleukin-21 in this system, we actually get normalization uh, of this growth factor. So even if we can't use IL-21, I think we're going to have ways around it. Okay, last, um, last point to go over is I'm going to take you now through a quick perspective on our clinical research. And I'm going to pose to you that the lack of surrogate markers is one of the major limitations for product development in PAD. The problem is that we do PAD trials we look for changes in walking time, which are highly variable, have a huge number of things that influence them. And the problem in PAD is you just don't have enough blood flow. So we are going to, we are working on the concept, really Chris Kramer, I just get the credit of being in the office next to him, um, uh, actually is the one working on this uh, and his group, that calf muscle perfusion by the way, not flow, and I'll talk about that, needs to be that surrogate endpoint. Okay, what's our argument behind that? So I'm going to do something egregious here, and I'm going to start the human argument with some mouse data. Okay, so these are mice that, this is a study we did back in 2008, and these are mice that overexpress the myoglobin gene. And this is the whole myoglobin gene. It's a muscle-specific gene. And sure enough, mice from this, in this model have impaired perfusion recovery. They have more cell death measured here and more apoptosis. The endothelium from those mice are actually completely normal. And in a paper more recently, we went on and directly showed that the thigh blood vessels because they're involved in remodeling and not tied into the distal blood vessels as much, are completely normal. The arteriogenic response in these mice is normal, yet they have an 
all the bad markers of PAD. Okay, when you look at humans, when you take patients, most of whom had complete SFA occlusions, not 100%, but probably over 90% of these subjects, and measured capillary density, sure enough, capillary density was correlated with every clinically relevant functional measure, peak VO2, peak walking time, claudication onset time. So if you have a total blockage on the inflow vessel, the capillary bed distally has functional significance. What happens when you exercise patients? By the way, if you ever want to not do human studies, this is an example. This is six years of human studies summarized in one slide. We took patients with intermittent claudication, randomized them to supervised exercise versus home exercise, and did studies on capillary density from muscle biopsies and peak VO2. And the bottom line is that you saw an increase in capillary density before you got an increase in peak VO2. If I showed you the home exercise group, they were completely flat across the way. And there was no change in leg blood flow as we could measure it no change in ABI, so we concluded that in patients with PAD, angiogenesis precedes increases in peak VO2. Fortunately, the NIH took our study and did the inverse of it. So you've probably heard about this study called CLEVER, which was supervised exercise versus primary stenting for claudication. So in, they took a patient with an SFA, or actually in this case an iliac artery occlusion, Instead of, they randomize them to exercise, which affects the microvessels, or inflow treatment that affects the larger vessels. And this trial, I'm not, you know, I was actually on the DSMB for this trial. This was a slam dunk for peripheral intervention. This should have absolutely won, and sure enough, it actually didn't. Uh, in point of fact, stenting was actually quite, um, um, did, uh, in fact, supervised exercise uh, probably did better uh, than stenting. And in both of these measures, and the, the concern of both peak walking time and claudication onset time, and the concern is that, well, you know, they did the exercise for six months, and that benefit would be lost if you went out to 18 months, and it absolutely has not. There was no difference statistically, but certainly not even when you stop the exercise, the patients with PAD did just as well um, from exercise training as they did from stenting. So again, they kind of did a little, we've had virtually all of these pieces. And then Chris uh, had this study where he showed, we had a group of patients uh, before and after angioplasty of an isolated inflow vessel, their ABIs completely normalized, calf muscle perfusion effectively was unchanged. So even if you change the large vessel, you're not actually changing the oxygen delivery we pose at the skeletal muscle um, level. And so this is being tested right now in a study uh, that we're just finishing uh, enrollment. Uh, this was an NIH trial that there were some 1,200 applications for nine awards, uh, and we were fortunate enough to get them, again, largely on the basis of this argument uh, that I presented to you. So again, to review current risk factors for peripheral arterial disease are age, diabetes, smoking, do and know how to calculate the ABI, review the major clinical manifestations. The absence of symptoms in PAD is not the absence of disease. The patients do just as badly. Understand the differences between intermittent claudication and critical limb ischemia. Uh, and as far as advancing medical therapies, we'll have to stay tuned uh, for that. Um, the, I don't have, uh, here's Ayatunde uh, de Kuhn uh, in the back, Tau. Uh, and uh, who did a lot of the work on the interleukin-21 uh, receptor. Sorovi's not in this picture, uh, and a lot of other people uh, besides that to thank. Thank you very much. That was a, a phenomenal overview, I think. Uh, the points that came across, and we appreciate uh, uh, especially the, the highlights of the myths and everything. I think thank you very much. 
uh, in the in the area of the clinical world um, and the 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 currently available digital uh, monitor testing, which is the thermal monitoring and the tonometry, yeah. is there a role for them to and is there evidence to suggest that those should be more? I know there's data on on coronary artery disease and yeah. outcome prediction. But is there a paradigm to use that because it's much easier to implement it in private offices to yeah. screen and then refer for ABIs? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. Before I um, – we, we've actually done two studies to determine whether or not this idea of screening diabetics and smokers actually works. Um, at Duke, um, we actually set up a program where we did ABI testing for free. Um, and sure enough, you know, now, like North Carolina and Texas is a lot of PAD, um, so it's pretty efficient. Um, and what we did is if you had an abnormal ABI, then we went on and did the uh, pressure volume loops. Um, so we did it for free just because the amount of money in the billing, the $5, you know, $7 or whatever you can collect, wasn't worth it. We actually just repeated this at UVA. Um, and did the same thing through a clinical trial. And sure enough, you t we went to a diabetes clinic, took every diabetic over 50. A third of them had an abnormal ABI, uh, even without any uh, symptoms. You know, I, I, I'm not sure it's been, anything's been systematically tested uh, to be better than uh, ABI. ABI, again, does not predict the clinical syndrome but it definitely is diagnostic for the disease. So I think till proven otherwise, I probably, you know, I don't think there's enough data to go around that yet. Because we, we have the digital uh, yeah. monitoring under Dr. Uh, you know, Cook's uh, guidance. We're doing some research, but the company promotes it as a PVD testing or endothelial yeah. dysfunction testing, and the billing apparently is equal to an ABI. So if you do that, then you can do an ABI. Okay, so fair enough. I, I, I'll, I'll have to look, I'll look into that. I actually, that's, that's what's great about this. You learn uh, things. Just a comment on that. That yeah. device is for measuring endothelial function. Correct. Right, it's not. And it's, uh, it doesn't actually measure pressures in right. the leg. It provides useful information, but knowing the API actually is important for a lot of reasons. Right. You measure. One is, just, just to mention, uh, we did a study, uh, NIH funded study to look at the genetics of peripheral arterial disease. In the, in the context of that, we took people coming to our cath lab yes. and studied them intensively. We found about 20% um, of people coming to the cath lab had mm -hmm. a low ankle brachial index, uh, 0.9 or under. And only a third of those, to your point, only a third of those had been recognized right. prior to the cath. And, and that's a shame because um, the, the, the PAD patients demonstrably have increased risk of the cath itself. They have about a 2x uh, increase in risk. You might change your approach if you know that person has peripheral arterial disease. You might yeah, I, the arm. So it's important, I think, to, for, to document. Yeah, I, I don't know. Our, our cath lab at this point does almost all of our cases radially, so we don't, uh, I think we're up to about 75% uh, uh, radio. But still, to the point, you need to know if it's there. And I. And the concept of measuring endothelial dysfunction, I think, is a very attractive one. Um, and I bet you, again, with, we could probably put that together very quickly um, uh, as a study, uh, because I think that would be important to know. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating that exercise actually is, is the mode of therapy at this stage of the game. What, what is the mechanism? Um, meaning, obviously, you can see increased capillary density. What is the underlying mechanism of that? Is it sustained hypoxia? Is it, uh, yeah, and at the molecular level, what do we know more? Is uh, resting perfusion improved on these patients with MRI or whatever technology? And lastly, along the same line, why is supervised as opposed to home? And what I'm talking about simply is, is this pushing patients at a longer duration or more heavier activity? What, what, is, uh, what is the prescription? <clears throat> so the prescription for supervised exercise is three times a week, three sessions over 12 weeks, and I think you're allowed to miss four. 
uh, over that period, or else you are considered, maybe it's six, something in that range. Um, you warm up, you go on the treadmill, they bring the treadmill up, till the point that you, they have a scale of leg pain, okay, and it goes up to 20. When you reach 18, they will slow the treadmill down. You put your feet on either side of the treadmill, and they tell you, okay, is your pain gone? And you say yes, and they put you right back on. And you do that for 45 minutes three times a week. And the reality is, up till this study by Andy Gardner, nobody has actually shown that home exercise does anything. In fact, you know, some people have gone as far as to say recommending it's a waste of time. Um, regarding the mechanism, our study in ATVB was able to conclude that the increase in capillary density, since we did not see an increase in um, um, in ABI or plethysmography uh, did not suggest that it was a large vessel process, but a small vessel or angiogenic process. Uh, interestingly, in a follow-up paper, we went and looked at vascular endothelial growth factor, and sure enough, you know, everybody expected vascular endothelial growth factor to go up. Uh, it did not. Um, so we're looking at other things. You know, these are muscle biopsies, and they're not easy um, uh, to get. Uh, we're currently expanding our work on the vascular endothelial growth factor family, uh, and we have some other factors that may uh, be involved in that. Is resting perfusion true? We, by plethysmography, no. Um, again, we're going to try to test that directly between Chris's grant and my grant. Uh, looking for that. So the interesting thing is, why would they improve? If resting perfusion is not improved, uh, do they have better adaptive mechanisms? Oh. Uh, you know, yeah. something like this, because... Yeah, it's a great question. We, again, I think at the end of the day, we have to test that. My hypothesis is going to be, if capillary density is higher, perfusion, okay, into the muscle is going to be higher. That's what we actually posed. We're we will be unblinding our data probably around June uh, from our study, um, and we'll have a chance to look at this measure. Great. Hi, Brian. Thank you again very much for a very refreshing presentation. I tell you why, because as a, I'm a peripheral interventionalist, and every time I've been part of a PAD talk, we show five different stands and seven different stands, and if you get bored, we show three <laughs> more rotablations. I'm so glad you didn't show any of that. So, um, But that being said and done, I think you're, you're highlighting the importance of ABI in the cardiology clinics as a screening tool, identifying patients with PAD and their co coexistence CAD is, I think, very important. I think it's going to be a very important part of all our cardiologists going forward. Um, as an interventionalist, one of the biggest challenges I see is assessing perfusion versus CAR, ischemia versus CAR. I think the CLI field has been a struggle for us, not because of the iliofemoral treatments. I think we do what we do and get away with it. The, it's a tibio peroneal. Yes. That is the biggest challenge for us, and I think for CLI patients, I wonder what your institution is using in terms of ischemia or SCAR, and how do you kind of design your therapies around that? Because I think we, we have three arteries. We have three arteries in the heart. We have 300 grams in the heart, and we have 10 times more muscles. And the amount of uh, focus we have is so limited. Yeah. And I wonder if there is a way we can better ourselves in assessing that. And just to add one more question, I was very curious about some of your genetic work. I think it's fascinating. Um, diabetes. Um, I, Maybe I missed it, but I didn't see a lot of data on diabetic mice. So, yeah. uh, what what is the another thing we see, and maybe you guys see it there as well, is there is a higher CLI prevalence, frustrations with therapies in certain racial differences. For example, South Asians, Hispanics. We keep on doing the same things for all varieties of patients, but the outcomes are much worse. So, is there something to do with genetics? If you can comment on that, thank you. For, uh, very, very, uh, uh, in, uh, those are excellent questions. Um, unfortunately, in fact, we had a meeting on 
uh, let's see, was it Wednesday? And we agreed that we have absolutely no standard uh, for how we approach any of these things. I, you know, being a former interventional cardiologist, your standard is what worked last time and what didn't work last time, you don't do the next time. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that is a lot of the approach to this. And I really think we do need to be smarter about it. Um, th some people, we will pro if you if pushed, I will probably tell you we probably follow the angiosome concept of trying to find the inflow vessel in a straight line. It doesn't make it right. It just means that's what we do. Um, and, and I think there are huge racial uh, and genetic uh, differences. Diabetes is critical. Uh, I, I'm going to not go into it because this could be a long answer. But what I will tell you is the genetic differences between bulb C and black six mice are stronger than the diabetes uh, uh, influence. If I take a black six mice, make them diabetic, they don't do as badly uh, as the bulb C. So at least in the mice, uh, the genetic factors are uh, very strong. Uh, regarding uh, you know, uh, other issues in racial outcomes, I, I fully agree with you, and we don't understand it. I, I think we need to really begin to understand at, at the end of the day, I still think the problem in PAD is we're not getting enough blood flow. And I think we've got to stop trying to use all these other, you know, um, um, or discussions about it. Focus on that, at least till it's proven right or wrong. Um, and then I think we have to continue to try to look at the difference between flow, which is often measured by the ABI, uh, and perfusion, which, by the way, can be very, very uh, different. Not different, by the way, for the heart, where there's a whole group of patients that have no epicardial coronary disease, yet have these perfusion defects. And for years, we kind of dismissed those patients. And I think the PAD has the same um, equ equivalent. The problem is, it's just, it's very hard to get studies done uh, in uh, PAD. There's just a lot of different, uh, for a lot of different reasons that are probably beyond what I can uh, answer. There's a lot more to talk about, but we've okay. run over. So thank you very much, okay. Dr. Annex. <laughs>